Mr. De Soto, uh, what do you think is the best way to put back the human at the center of the globalization process? Well, obviously, there's nothing like uh, case examples. I mean, we are talking about humanity, but I always believe that you should look at somebody specific to understand uh, the globality or the humanity of it all because it's individual lives that matter. That is why I think that any idea of reform not only includes the kind of things I do, which are uh, macro uh, measures, the purpose of which is, is to influence or to change the attitudes of millions of people, but you need uh, various organizations doing something with even a small group of people for just one or two people. So uh, the way not to lose the dimension, of course, of uh, the single human being is to make sure that small projects got on their way and that they're well documented so we can all learn from them. <laughs> Do I think globalization can help and uh, introduce democracy? It depends on, how, of course, how you define globalization. Uh, many people define it as essentially the interests of multinationals. Uh, in that sense, uh, I don't think that it is in their agenda. They will probably insist also that it doesn't have to be in their agenda. Uh, multinationals, like any corporation, has essentially as an objective to make money. And if it doesn't make money, it disappears. So that is their primum mobile. Uh, if we understand globalization, rather, as uh, something that concerns us all, including non-governmental organizations, political parties, uh, politicians, who have to cope with uh, the fact that they are now no longer in full control as when nationalities dominated the world, that now uh, people and uh, resources can move very quickly between one country and to another, that is to say, uh, globally, obviously we can do something about it. Uh, we can do something about it because we can learn from each other much better. You know, there isn't, unfortunately, one way to do democracy. If you were to go now to a developing country and say, I am Swiss, I would like to tell you how we do democracy. First of all, you don't really have a president. You have a Conseil Federal, and uh, it's composed of seven people. Now, they will take turns, protocolarly speaking, but they will none of them really be in charge. That's democracy for us. And every time we want to consult a major law, we will have a process called the Vernim Lassum. And every time we have conflicting ideas on how to solve a problem, we will hold a referendum, which, by the way, is not like the French, um, who uh, hold just a choice between saying yes and no, but you can actually choose between different opportunities. And uh, at the, if all of this doesn't work, locally we'll do the Landsgemeinde a sort of bit. You've defined Switzerland's way of looking at democracy. If you look at the American way, whereby it's an electoral college that elects one president that is all powerful and can move armies all over the world, it's a different type of democracy, and the British are certainly very different. So what that indicates to you is that democracy can take many shapes and forms, and that is why it is useful to think of globalization as an opportunity to become familiar with the different models and try and find out of essence, what it is you want from each, and inspire yourself. I mean, to begin with, for example, uh, the Swiss organization, which is so different from any other one in the world, is originally inspired in 1848 by the American Constitution. So it shows that you can learn from one, one country to the other. In that sense, globalization could provide a, a sphere of exchange that could help democracy come into place. Uh, the first thing we want to do is, I think, compare the first Zermatt summit to the second Zermatt summit. Um, I think it's more precise in the second one, in the sense that uh, clearly the, uh, the ethical aspect comes out uh, uh, more clearly to me than the first one did. Uh, there's a, at least where I participated, there is more uh, emphasis on the personal responsibility and accountability. Uh, obviously, what we're trying to do here is explore how ethics uh, also affects not only your personal commitment 
to things, but how you can bring ethics into government, which is, for example, my concern. Uh, I'm less concerned simply because I don't have that kind of a formation of convincing people one-to-one, -one, but I do want ethics in government and in public bodies. And possibly uh, the interesting thing about the first and the second is that they can give us some information as to how to do the third. Uh, I find it very attractive to be here because if I go anywhere to talk about globalization, it is very punctual things. It has to do with the movement of capital, with the movement of money. It has to do with the importance of uh, creating statutes and creating conventions that allow us to get along better. But that emphasis that there is on ethics here, I think, is, uh, is, is, is a very important and a, a very interesting one. And the whole challenge to me, as I see the, uh, the first two uh, summits go by, is to find out how the call for ethics on the public sector can be matched and uh, made to look as part of the agenda of also the personal commitment of people to doing things ethically.